All right, we've got a couple reports to start off the morning. Um, I was just visiting with uh, with you know several friends over here, and I was telling about some experience that I had recently. You know, you get to uh, be my age, and it seems like we're you go to more doctor checkups and whatnot. And I was at the doctor just a couple weeks ago, and and you know I hurt my I hurt my left knee pretty seriously three years ago, and I'm a candidate for a knee replacement now. But so I. It's harder. It's harder for me to get as much exercise as I once once did. And the but the doctor he was concerned and he said, "So Eric, does obesity run in your family?" And I said, "Oh no, sir. No one runs in our family." And so, um, wanted to have a little humor, get everybody laughing a little bit as we get going this morning on our affiliate report. Karina Jones um, is our staff member that works most directly with our affiliates and since she's not here, I'm pinch hitting for her. Um, I apologize that I'm again on the agenda um, right after the affiliate report to give a marketing committee report. Um, but the affiliate networking continues to be a, a strong priority here at RCAF and we've got, we'll um, rotate through the listing of, of uh, our affiliates here. Um, we're proud to have 20 affiliates across 14 states on our affiliate roster. Each of these organizations are unique and offer their own culture for their areas and for their members, which we fully support, from supporting youth in their own areas to fighting local issues like public grazing and predator challenges to property taxes and property rights. They're all working at their local and state levels in addition to working on national issues that RCAF's fighting for. I'd be lying if I stood here and said that that doing this kind of work is easy. Um, being an trying to establish and, and run an affiliate uh, uh, like this in their own areas, is it, it's time consuming um, and, it, and it's challenging. There are a lot of issues to learn, to keep up on. Um, I know the, uh, myself, I'll visit with different affiliate members from time to time and I welcome those calls and I know other directors um, do as well. You know, we're truly all better working together. We have, you know, we have more room on our affiliate roster for like-minded groups. So anyone that's uh, sitting in this room or watching online, if you'd like to start uh, a county, regional, or state RCAF affiliate organization, please reach out to Karina. She's ready to assist and help. And if, you, if you're part of an existing producer group that would like more information, reach out to Karina. She can answer questions and provide you with, with more information. She is currently engaged with new groups from California to North Carolina. You know, no group is too big, nor too small, or too diverse. So let's continue to build this valuable part of RCAF, our affiliate network. And so let's, let's give all of our affiliates a big round of applause, please. All right, we'll, we'll move right into our marketing committee report. Um, you know, it was just a year ago that I stood here and gave a report on um, the 5014 bill, Senate Bill 949. And, and it was still at play um, just a year ago at our convention. And then not, af not long after the convention, um, deal making started. And, and I'd like to give a little uh, comparison. It was, it was in our program, uh, the comparison between the original 5014 and the, and the compromise. And, but I've got some notes here that I wanted to touch briefly on. We've, we've had some criticism. There, there are folks out there that have said that, well, we, you know, we've, we just, we've, we've got to compromise. You know, we've just got to do whatever it takes. We've got to get something done. Um, and, and I'll deal with all that, but so you, you look at the, t the top two items here, um, and the, the very first one just applies to how big the players are, how big the Packers would need to be before they would have to comply with, with these rules. And there was, it was not exactly the same formula, but an item number one, pretty good agreement. All right, item, item number two, the same way, you know, um, the cattle need to be uh, slaughtered within 14 days of purchase, right? So that's pretty simple. And then from there, uh, almost nothing 
uh, resembles the original 5014. And I've highlighted what I find it to be pretty interesting um, is almost on every item it says delegates to USDA. You know, that, that, that third one establishes the minimum percentage. Um, and, and the 5014 bill, that's why it was called 50. And my next slide, when, when we, when, uh, in two more slides, I'll get to what happened, what actually happened in the industry last week as far as percent cash trade and, and where we're at currently. But then you go down to item number three, um, the, the, the minimum purchase requirements were gonna be plant by plant. And of course the opponents, they did absolutely did not want that. They wanted it by region. And for example, in my region, if, if that were the case, there would still be a major packer that would not have to bid because there's one of the other majors that's already buying enough cash negotiated um, to, to, uh, to fulfill the whole region's requirement. And so um, there were definitely fallacies um, with this compromise bill. Um, you go to it, C. You go down to the, the third one here, and it says the minimum cash purchase requirement would take effect upon passage of the bill um, immediately, whereas the compromise, they've, they've given themselves another two years to come up with the program. And I don't know uh, uh, what everybody in this room thinks, but I know as a, as a feeder, um, another couple years of dangling out here is, is gonna make it really difficult. We're gonna lose a lot of a smaller feeders if, if we go another two years. And then clear, the, the, the last two here are really interesting. Um, second to the bottom, it says, it was gonna uh, prevent those that already have um, captive supply arrangements with the packer from being able to also fulfill cash sales to the same packer, which just makes sense. If, if they already have a deal, how do you know that that's actually gonna be a, a, a solid negotiated price when they already have a, a working arrangement? And of course, the compromise uh, doesn't um, address that. And then um, finally, the, the 5014 bill would have granted the states the ability to, to raise the, the minimum if they so chose. And of course, the compromise bill doesn't address that either. And so because, because of these shortfalls, we've, um, We've not supported it. And it doesn't mean that we're not trying to tighten these things up behind the scenes, and, and we are. All right, so let's, let's look at what happened last week um, in, in the feedlot country. So you got up at the top, the uh, Iowa-Minnesota area negotiated 76.2% of the slaughter cattle last week. For an, and the average price was $1.4666, okay? Drop down to the Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico area, they negotiated at 9%, and their, their price was $1.40. Colorado, 6.6%, of course, we don't know the price because of confidentiality. Drop down, Kansas negotiated 20.4 at a price of 139.87. Nebraska, you, know, you jump up close to that 50% negotiated level and their price jumps up to $1.4537. So you look at this and lay it next to 5014. There's a reason that that 50% level was put in that um, Senate file 949 to begin with, because you've, recap you've recaptured quite a bit of the price discrepancy between the North and the South by being up near 50% cash. And down at 9%, you're giving up six, almost $7. And, and actually what's going on this week is gonna be even a little wider spread than that. There were cattle traded in the North yesterday at 149 and in Kansas at 138. And so maybe the averages will be a little tighter than that, but the, the trend continues, all right? And, um, and so the, the other thing that sometimes goes missing is the, the big volume of cattle is in the South where they're trading a low percentage cash. And so the average of those four regions, if you leave Iowa, Minnesota out, that's 85% of the kill down there, and they're only trading cash negotiated at 24.2%. And so, uh, and under the compromise bill, it, it's likely that the, like the Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico area maybe would move from 9% cash to 13%. Well, it, it'll take forever at, at that kind of an incremental change 
um, because there's so many cattle there. The majority of the cattle are there, and that's where the cash negotiation needs to happen. NCBA President Don Scheffelbein in an op-ed piece mentioned just yesterday that it's the, the, only, the only problem the industry has is just it's, it's price discovery, knowing what the prices are. And I say that unless you have dynamic to and fro and, and, a, and, and an active cash negotiation, um, that that is how you get a fair price. And just discovering um, a price that's affected by a lack of negotiation, that isn't the real problem. The real problem is, is having an active market, all right? So we need help, right? We, we need someone to come in and help us. You know, here's um, the famous chart that, that Bill Bullard has put together. He updated that here recently. You know, you've got the cash price, the steer price in the, re in the red line, um, and the uh, uh, fresh beef prices, the retail prices in blue, and it's, it's off the chart. The spread since 2015, you know, it's just completely diverged. Along with this, this is a sad, a sad chart. The, the, num the number of uh, U.S. feedlots and the decline that we've seen since 2011 in particular. It's just they've, they've fallen off uh, tremendously. And those, and that's the area where the cash negotiation happens, right? So you can see, you know, kind of what's at work. So, it, it, you know, we, we've known for some time that we, we need help from the uh, uh, academic side of, of, uh, uh, of the world um, to come up with studies that really outline and, and put all these facts in, in proper order. So we've needed a posse to come in and help us. And, and, and I'm here today to, to further point out the fact that since we met here a year ago, there's been a number of economic studies that have come out that have helped and are gonna continue to help tremendously. The first one was released in, in December of last year study called Multi-Plant Coordination in the U.S. Beef Packing Industry came out from the Center for Ag and Rural Development at Iowa State University, um, Chris Pudens and Lee Schultz. And so I'm going to encourage all of you, you know, you can do a Google search for Iowa State Cattle Market Study and it'll come up. But if you haven't read these, please do. They'll, they'll, they really pr provide a tremendous outline to further understand what, what we're really up against. After that, we had our, our friend Peter Carstensen at the University of Wisconsin put out a paper, Dr. Pangloss, in an ag as an agricultural e economist, the analytic failures of the U.S. beef supply chain, issues and challenges. Tremendous, tremendous paper. Um, very thought-provoking. Next, in April, from Dr. Bob Taylor, harvested cattle, slaughtered markets. Um, Tri-State Livestock News, hats off to them for uh, running um, the majority of uh, a, a good summary of Dr. Taylor's paper along with some of the proposed solutions that he put, um, put forth. Um, you know, Dr. Bob did a lot of work clear back in the, in the picket case uh, years ago um, and has been a friend to RCAF, a friend of this industry for a long time, and uh, I tried to get him to to come out here and, and fly out here and join us for the meeting, and he he said that his his uh, he has tremendous disdain for air travel anymore as he's gotten older, and he passed, but he did want me to greet all of his friends here. And uh, anyway, he he's tickled to be doing all that he can um, to help us. And then we'll move on to last but not least um, the study. Buyer power in the beef packing industry, an update on research in progress. And this is a, is a study that is in progress. And you, you have these uh, individuals that have, that have uh, helped with this. Francisco Guardio at, from ITAM, Minji Kim from Georgetown, Nathan Miller from Georgetown, and Matthew Weinberg from The Ohio State University. Um, and this is my segue into our, our next speaker. Um, Nathan H. Miller from Georgetown. 